to me, one of the easiest ways to uh, talk about trauma is this idea of the spectrum of trauma. And those of you that are uh, clinicians or trauma professionals here, this will be familiar to you. But um, on the one end of the spectrum is stress. Uh, this is Hans Selye, and this is a definition of stress as the non-specific response of the body to any demand for change. So uh, in this definition, stress is neither um, necessarily good nor bad. As Sean mentioned, today's um, a day like a launch day for me, and there's exciting things happening, and it's stressful. It's like we can get good news, and it can be stressful. So it's any demand for change on our nervous system. That is distinguished from traumatic stress, kind of the next level of the spectrum here. Here's a definition. Um, traumatic stress is the response to shocking and emotionally overwhelming situations that may involve actual or threatened death, serious injury, or threat to physical integrity. Again, we could have a whole conversation here about ways that certain forms of violence and harm have not been included historically inside of the mainstream definition of trauma. Like for example, sexual violence often directed towards women was not included in the diagnostic statistical manual for a number of years until actually, I think it was the early nineties to the third, the third um, edition. So anyway, this, this is just a, it's an important mirror for us, but that's a working definition that I'd have around trauma distinguished from just everyday stress. I also want to mention, you know, I, I think it can get a little dangerous these days. Trauma is uh, becoming more popular being talked about in many ways. And I think there's a, there's a definition called concept creep or a term where in the humanities, a term will kind of creep across its boundaries. And trauma sometimes I think can be, that can happen where someone says, oh my gosh, that, that line at the grocery store was totally traumatic. And I want to be cautious with us here about, you know, keeping some integrity to the term based on that definition. Uh, this can happen in, trauma can happen in a number of ways. Uh, for that I want to point out, um, directly experiencing a traumatic event, Second is witnessing a traumatic event it can also have a uh, really big impact on us. Learning that an event occurred to a family member or a close friend or also repeated exposure. So I have a cousin now who's a paramedic and I've been talking to him about just what it means to be exposed often to trauma and the impact that can have. So um, the next place here on the spectrum is something known as post-traumatic stress. And this means any symptoms that carry on past the traumatic event. Uh, a couple of categories of post-traumatic stress, these are kind of like the main buckets, are intrusion, avoidance, and arousal. So intrusion are things like uh, flashbacks, intrusive thoughts, or memories. It could be also intrusive sensations, like at any point, you know, I live through trauma and then all of a sudden I will have just this gripping in my stomach or I'll become really hypervigilant and, and tight in my shoulders. So intrusion is one area of post-traumatic stress. Um, avoidance is another cluster of symptoms. Someone might avoid uh, um, internal reminders of a trauma. That can be like, if that if I, the example about my stomach clenching, I might just uh, habitually dissociate and avoid that feeling. That can also be avoiding certain people, certain street corners, certain ge um, geographical areas. Again, all of these are ways that we try to take care of our safety, um, but just wanna acknowledge that around avoidance. I just wanna put a pin in this too. Avoiding our inner world is a very common strategy and meditation can run counter to that. So we'll come back to that about ways that uh, trauma is difficult in meditation. Um, and then finally, arousal and reactive symptoms. This is uh, really the havoc that trauma can play on our nervous system. Uh, the metaphor that I use is that this idea of uh, or accelerator and brake of our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, post-traumatic stress, often involves slamming one of these pedals to the floor in an ongoing way, 
or at worst, both petals are slammed to the ground at the same time. So you can just imagine here for yourself moments where it was like, whoa, I was just flooded with energy, it was too much, or I was the brake was slammed and I was numb or shut down or dissociated. Uh, finally, we have um, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Again, so we take all of these different symptom clusters and what PTSD draws is a line in the sand and says, okay, well, if people meet this criteria for a period of at least one month, then they could have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. So that is the spectrum of trauma or at least one, um, one view on it. And the reason that I wanted to, Sean, good call, good call start here is um, there is a wide spectrum here. And you know, international research says that at minimum 90% of us will live through a traumatic event in our lifetimes. I think of it as closer to 100%. You'd think that at some point we're experiencing some degree of whether it's traumatic loss uh, whether it's life or death, experience ourselves or with others. So it's, you know, to live through a trauma is very prevalent. However, not everyone that lives through a trauma will necessarily develop symptoms of post-traumatic stress. So then if you go to the other end of a spectrum, research tells us that about three and a half percent of the population will experience PTSD at any given time. And what I wanted to highlight here is that in any room where you are offering meditation practice, to me, it's a safe bet that there will be someone there on the spe on the spectrum spectrum who who may be struggling with trauma. And trauma sensitive practice, which I'll define in a moment, it really has you entering into any teaching or any clinical work with the assumption that trauma is there. And especially given COVID-19 and the impacts and the adversity that people are facing in different communities, I think it's a safe bet. But what would it mean for you to just assume that trauma is there and to not be surprised if someone came to you and they said, I'm experiencing flashbacks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm saying that in no way to promote fear or to, to fear monger. It's actually to say, if you're aware of trauma and you've done some work around it to become trained in trauma informed practice, then you just have more tools and you'll be prepared and it's nothing to be afraid of. Um, it's okay if people get triggered um, inside a practice, we can talk more about that. Um, and, and it's useful to expect that it will, uh, it will arise. 